Hello everyone, here we are. We're gonna get started tonight with 1 Corinthians 10. And I'm hoping that we're gonna get all the way to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So let's get started. Apostle Paul, still speaking to the church at Corinth. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. So that would be the cloud of the Lord, the cloud of protection. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That was their baptism, walking through the water. They all ate the same spiritual food. That would be the manna and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So even though they had not heard of Christ yet, or Jesus Christ crucified, Christ was there. In the Old Testament often, as we know, he was referred to as the angel of the Lord. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, uh, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Don't be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, quote, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry, end quote. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. Now, why does the Lord keep sticking on this point? Okay, well, we know it's because he loves us and he gave us our bodies and he intended them to be treated by us in a certain way that would be pure, okay? But the other reason that he doesn't like sexual immorality is because in the days of the Jews, all of the pagan tribes surrounding them, the Gentiles, those that weren't Jews, would worship their gods through sex, through orgies and sexual immorality. That was how they worshiped. So in the Old Testament, the Lord told the Jews, don't you dare worship me with sex. Matter of fact, if you have sex, you wait until a period of cleansing after you've had sex. You wait till that period of cleansing is over before you come to worship me. Okay, so God was separating the Jews by that law, that rule, that command from the pagans around them. He was making them different. And we remember that those who didn't obey were done away with. The Lord was not having it. Okay, he wanted a holy people, he wanted a separate people, and he did whatever it took to cull out the evildoers and keep that holy people and that line of people pure. Okay, so this is a sticking point with the Lord. You don't take a bodily function and use it to worship the Lord. It's base. It's not good enough. The Lord wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. He doesn't want to be worshipped by you uh, having doing sexual activity. That's just too carnal and fleshy for words. That's the devil's business. Not sex as a creation, but worshipping gods with a small g through a sex act is very base and carnal, and God isn't having it from his people, and that includes you and I today, if we call ourselves Christians, okay? Uh, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. He's talking about the Jews now. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. I told you the Lord was serious about creating a holy people for himself. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Remember the Lord sent snakes among them and the snakes picked them off. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Once again, the Lord was deadly serious about choosing who was gonna come with him all the way and who wasn't good enough. 
because they weren't serious, okay? Just because we get serious about the Lord doesn't mean we're fuddy-duddies or no fun. It just means that we live the, the way the Lord asked us to. And in reality, that brings such a deep peace that you can't help but be having fun. Peace is a lot of fun, guys. It may not look like the fun the world has, but I guarantee you it's more satisfying. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. So if the Lord sent snakes in there and all kinds of stuff and picked them off, what do you think he's going to do to this generation that doesn't, that doesn't honor him with their bodies? You think he's going to say, come on into my home? No. No, because it's a great offense to, to take your flesh and do something fleshy to worship this God. He doesn't want it. Okay? And were written down as warnings for us on whom this culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Oftentimes when we think we're the strongest, that's when we get tipped over by the enemy. So always be watching. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So you're not unique, okay? You're going through what we all go through. And God is, it says, common to mankind. And God is faithful. He won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Okay, I want to say something about what we read last night. It said, if you were called and you were circumcised, don't seek to be uncircumcised. If you're uncircumcised, don't seek to be circumcised. And we were talking about, and I gave you the example of my mother leaving her marriage and going off with another man after she'd had a spiritual awakening in a 12-step program. And I, I thought about it later, and I think most likely it's saying, you know, if you're circumcised, that would be the Jews. Uh, if you're a Jew, then just stay where you are. And if you're uncircumcised, a Gentile, don't seek to be circumcised. Don't seek to be a Jew. I think that was just representative of the Jew and Gentile thing. And then it went on and said a couple of other things. Uh, but in that regard, because I was like, how can you be, uh, uncircumcised if you're, or how can you, if you are circumcised, how can you become uncircumcised? And the only way I could, uh, after mulling it over, the only way I could figure it is he must be talking about Jews and Gentiles and Gentiles being the uncircumcised, Jews being the circumcised. So, you know, Gentiles don't need to seek becoming a Jew, like, oh, I'm saved now, I'm going to jump right into the Jewish religion. Not necessary, as we know already. Okay. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Now, sex can be an idol, okay? We know this. We know this so well because so many of us have idolized it. I've idolized it, okay? I speak, and it's not a conscious thing. It's not like you're going, I worship sex. It's your behavior. Um, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Okay, remember the priests get to partake of the, the offerings, okay, which are burned on the altar as sacrifices. Uh, so this way they get, they get fed. The workman is worthy of his meat. Okay, so I'm going to read that again. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean that that do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. So those gods with a small g are demon, demonic presences stealing worship. Okay, that's the way the devil gets worshipped is by setting up false gods and getting people to believe in them. Okay. And I do not want, I'm going to read that again. No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, with a capital G. And I don't want you to be participants with demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. 
You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Okay, so we can look at that uh, in light of sexual immorality. You cannot be standing in the presence of the Lord on Sunday or wherever you're doing it and then go out and be sexually immoral. Okay, it's just it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're going to, you know, you're going to fall one way or the other. You're not going to straddle that fence for long. Um, are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Now, we do serve a God that does feel jealous. He gets hurt, okay? And we need to uh, understand that and honor that, that this God is going to get angry if he feels he's being aroused to be jealous of some demon that you're worshiping, okay? Now, sex is not a demon, but when we're idolizing it, there could be a demon behind that idolatry that's getting worshipped, okay? Especially if our sex is uh, practiced immorally. Then, of course, there's demonic presences involved in that kind of behavior, all right? I mean, we don't need the devil to help us sin. We can do that all by ourselves, but oftentimes, you know, when there's uh, an idol worship type thing going on, that's where the devil loves to stand like, oh, worship me, worship me. I'll hide behind what you're doing and you're actually worshiping me. Okay, that's what he does. That's how desperate he is. Okay. Uh, are we trying to arrive? Okay, so I'm going to say this again. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You can't have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So, you, you know, you're kind of cruising for a bruise in there. You're going to get hurt. I have the right, and I'm not saying that like the Lord's a bully and he's going to slaughter you. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying the Lord is strong and he can allow you to fall down in that pit of idolatry and you're going to get hurt. I have the right to do anything you say. Here we go again. But not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything but not everything is constructive. In other words, it's not going to help you. Okay, it's not going to help you. It's not building anything for you. It's in, in, in essence, it's tearing something down about you. You're basically cutting off your own feet. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And that's what keeps us safe. Be busy about the Lord's business. Be busy helping his people and serving others. Okay? Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth, quote, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Okay? So I almost see that like when you go to someone's house, if they serve you something you don't normally eat, be polite. Take a bite. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. Isn't that amazing? I just said that, and I do that often. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. And you would have a right to say, ooh, you know, I can't do that because I serve the Lord you would have a right at that point because now they're bringing it into a spiritual thing. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? So you have the freedom to not eat it, okay? Um, for the sake of their conscience so that they don't have to feel bad that they fed you something that is not in your credo, your religious stance, your spirituality to eat, okay? If I take part in the meal with th thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? Why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So if you thank God for the food, even if it's foreign to you, it's okay.
So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. Oops. <laughs> you know how we can't please people. But, you know, I get what he's saying. He's talking about in the spiritual realms. He stays kind. He stays polite. He stays of service, okay? For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many so that they may be saved. And that's the bottom line, is to present a picture of Christ that will attract, okay? So that people will want to know what hope is in you. All right, chapter 11. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies. Now, let's not get upset that the head of the woman is man. Okay, it doesn't mean the woman is less than the man. It just means that there's decency and order to things. They are together equally yoked, hopefully. They're both believers. They're partners, okay? But somebody has to be the leader. In other words, that's the man's job. The woman should be grateful it's not hers. It's hard to lead, okay? The woman has another job. Okay, they're not one job's better than the other. No, but if you want to sit and fight over leadership, you're not going to have much of a marriage. The man is the one that God said is going to do this job, which is to lead, to protect, to cover. Don't you want those things? I find them quite wonderful. Okay, so if we're going to do this women's lib thing where it's like, no, I'm going to be the leader, you're not going to have a marriage for long. Somebody's got to be the designated decision, bottom line decision maker. And you got to let the man do that. Okay, all right. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. So don't, men, don't cover your head when you're uh, praying or prophesying. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as having her head shaved. Wow. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. Okay, now, part of this is could possibly be the tradition of the day because you do not see us covering our heads when we pray. I believe that the very next, because I constantly jump the gun, I'm going to say that I believe he's going to bring up a woman's hair as being her covering, okay? A man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. So let's remember that man was created first, okay, women? Let's remember that the man was the first creation of humankind, okay? Let's not seek to step on him over that and say, well, that doesn't matter. It, it does matter. He was the first. Doesn't mean he's more loved better, smarter, bright, none of that. It just means he was the first creation. Woman was pulled out of him, okay? We're, we are his perfect helper. We come right out of him. We're his beauty and his crown, okay? We are, man was made, but woman was fashioned. We're the crowning glory, okay? So, so be proud and be happy, you know, proud in a good way and be happy with your status, okay? And, and don't act like your status is lower than the man. It's not. If you're taken out of him, you can't be less than him, okay? But, you know, Paul's pretty stern here and a little strict and some people have trouble with this. We're not going to have trouble with it, okay? We're going to slide right through this and hear exactly what he's saying, all right? 
Uh, a man ought not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. What I just said that, okay? We were taken right out of him. So how can we be less than him? If somebody takes a piece of me, does that mean because it's not me, it's less than me? No, it's sacred because it's a piece of me. For a man, a man ought not to cover his head since he's the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man didn't come from, did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man to help him out. He needed help. We have a great job. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Now that's something we should probably look into. Um, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. There's your equality. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. That should be very, very clear to you. And we will go back and say, and look into this uh uh, verse six, uh, verse 10, it's for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of the angels. I'll look into it. I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? So Paul's kind of really belaboring this. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him? But now Jesus had long hair. So, okay, I'll look into all of this and pull it apart for you. But that if a woman has long hair, it's her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Wow. So I didn't even have to say anything. Paul just said it. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. So... What I'm getting out of it is that men should let their glory shine. Don't have hair interrupting your, your uh, face looking up to God. But a woman, because the woman was the first to fall, she needs that covering. That's me speaking. That's not from the Lord or from Paul. I'm thinking that the woman needs that covering because she fell. Also, I'm thinking that that covering represents the man covering her. Okay, that she's just something to be covered because she's so precious. I'm going to stand by that statement. That the woman has a beautiful covering because she is something so precious that she's covered. Because the man covers her, God covers the man and her, you know. All right, um, just me belaboring the point. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. So he's talking to the church in Corinth here. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. Okay, so what he's saying is when you come to the church, some of you are bringing your own little... Uh, Lord's Supper and you're sharing it in your little group instead of everybody eating it together, okay? So it makes, I guess, you look more holy, maybe, as he's saying you're trying to look more holy. I don't know. It says there's difference. Um, no doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, Aren't there always people like that that just have to show off and have to be exclusive and clicky? And as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Because there's all the wine is in that one little group. Okay. 
and someone else has been excluded from that group. So even though he's probably not literally drunk, it's probably just a way he's saying it. Like someone goes hungry, someone else gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? Gosh, don't we see people like this all the time? that just hurt others by their arrogance and how they act and their little clicks and it's just disgusting and it's everywhere, okay? I, I'm gonna read this whole thing again because I like it. In the following directives, I have no praise for you for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. In other words, divisions of like family clans and group clans and cliques and and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord that what I also passed on to you. Isn't it funny? It's like first graders. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, end quote. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, quote, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, end quote. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, like being over in your little clique, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. That's why we tell people if you're not a Christian, don't do the, don't do the communion. Okay, just stay away from it because it's really holy and it's something that we do to honor the Lord and the life he gave for us. Um, so he's telling these ugly people who don't care about others, who are clicky and having their own little suppers in the church. He's saying, uh, you're bringing judgment on yourself. You're sinning. That's why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. That means died. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we wouldn't come under such judgment. In other words, if we were paying attention to how we're coming off to others and, and if we were being kind to those around us, you know, like disciplining ourselves and paying attention to how we're acting, we wouldn't come under judgment, such judgment. Nevertheless, when we're judged in this way by the Lord, we're being disciplined. So discipline yourself so the Lord doesn't have to do it, right? so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. In other words, if you're a Christian and you're acting immature like that, if the Lord disciplines you, let it be so that you don't end up getting thrown into hell at the end of this world with the rest of the world, okay? But the best thing would be to discipline yourself first. Be self-aware. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who's hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. So apparently they're like hoarding stuff in their own little cliques and just pigging out on it or something. I don't know. And when I come, I will give further directions. All right, here we go. We're not going to get to 13 tonight, but we'll do this one as the last one. Uh, 13 is special, so it's good that it will be the first one tomorrow. So 1 Corinthians 12. Now about the gifts of the spirits of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. And I told you there are like nine gifts of the spirit of the Holy Spirit. And we all have some. Uh, you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. In other words, impotent idols. 
Uh, therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, at, in quotes, and no one can say, quote, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about mute idols being that they don't speak. There's no, and the Holy Spirit speaks, but mute idols, you know, demons, well, I don't know, sometimes demons can speak, but He's, let's read it again. I don't want to get my own stuff in there. Now, about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, quote, Jesus be cursed, end quote, and no one can say, Jesus, quote, Jesus is Lord, end quote, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one of the manifestation of now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there's given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. He's talking about how all our gifts work together to edify us. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. That would be private parts, you know, in the figurative body. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body. So we're all equal. That's me talking but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And I'll tell you right now with my body, you know, I still have a big fat swollen ankle and my whole body gets spasms of nerve pain from it that shoot right from that big fat swollen ankle. It's difficult. Okay, so my whole body is suffering because my ankle is hurt. And oh, it is so sore. My goodness gracious, I have never felt my skin this sore around that ankle in my life. It is so sore. And on top of it, because it's healing, it's starting to itch. So my whole body is affected by the ankle being hurt. Okay, and then of course on the other knee, on the other leg, I have the knee that is hurt, and that knee really hurts way more than the ankle. So I'm still in a world of hurt, but I'm up, I'm walking, and I'm living, okay? So your prayers really, really brought me through the first two weeks, which was utter suffering. And now it's it's doable, okay? You, you guys propelled me with your prayer, and I thank you so much for it. I, I, you know, a person who's hurt... We cherish your prayers like you can't believe, and we just thank you for them, and I'm thanking you for them. 
Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So if you're going to pray for some particular gifts, you want to pray for apostleship, prophecy, teachers, um, and then it goes down to miracles. Miracles is the fourth one in his list. Gifts of healing, the fifth one. That shows you. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't understand the cessationists that say that this stuff isn't available. Why would it be available to these hundreds of thousands of people uh, following the apostles and believing on Jesus Christ and then all of a sudden stop and not be available to us? They are available to us. And I'm living proof because you've heard me speak in tongues. Okay? I love you very much and I will see you tomorrow. You have a wonderful evening. We'll pick it up with 1 Corinthians 13, which is a very special chapter. I love you. Good night.